Thank you very much, Paul. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Ruth Needham. I work at the Trent Rivers Trust. For those of you that don't know, it's charity. We operate across the Trent catchment. Um, we are all about rivers and floodplains and catchment based approach. Um, I am the head of landscape and partnerships covering the whole of the Trent catchment. Um, so Trent Rivers Trust really does look at things from a catchment based approach. We try to look at the catchment and how flows, um, what happens to water, where it falls, what happens to it before it gets to a river and then actually in the river. Um, we try to do catchment measures that benefit the river, um, but also um, hold that water up in the catchment, uh, trap pollution, um, but also provide wider benefits, biodiversity, um, flood risk storage um, and so on. Very much about slowing the storing flow before it gets to the river, but once it's in the river, having as many natural processes uh, to create habitats and um, biodiversity and, and, a, and a really uh, biodiverse and fully functioning river connected to its floodplain. That's what we aim to do. We work with farmers, we work with members of the public, we work with a whole range of different stakeholders. We work with LFAs, um, uh, uh, Solly Hull and Leicestershire. Um, I'm pleased to share this event with today, are both in our patch. Uh, the patch um, on the right includes seven of the, sub, the seven subcatchments that all drain into the Trent, um, into the Humber Estuary. And I'm going to talk to you today about nature-based solutions, three, three sites where we've delivered nature-based solution in, um, in an urban setting um, within, within the Trent, um, two in the Tame and Ankamese catchment and one in the Saw. Um, okay, so next, first, First up is uh, in the Tame and Um This is a retrofit of a SUDS scheme. Um, so the Mies is a triple SI. Um, it um, is designated for its um, plant and fish species. Um, and there are, it's failing for phosphate. Um, it's got quite high levels of phosphate and there is flood risk. This particular site we identified might be suitable for a, a retrofit of suds in that the road, ray, road drainage you can see off Widgeon Drive at the top flows um, previously through surface water, traditional surface water network, it, straight into the river with any runoff from pollutants from the road. What we did was we um, designed a scheme to um, divert, to fill in gully pots and divert that surface water into a series of swales where the water would drop out, and uh, the pollution would drop out, and then before it reaches the river. Um, so very much using a nature-based solution within that green space to reduce the flood risk, and also enhance the biodiversity of the area of what was previously a fairly flat and um, un uninteresting bit of public open space. That's what it looked like before. And um, that's what it looks like now, where you can see the, the channel um, as it flows down towards the Mies in the distance and in the bottom right hand corner, you can see um, where the gully pot was filled, three gully pots were filled and the water is diverted underneath the pavement into a swale um, and then slowly discharges down into the basins and then eventually into the river. In terms of um, challenges, because um, uh, going back to the, the uh, purpose of this, the subject of this particular um session um it was it was problematic in a in a few areas i mean it's we're really pleased with the result and um, but it did take an awful lot of legwork to get the permissions in place um we had a few headaches um um with the with the highways authority and that it was highways drainage um we actually filled in three gully pots it wasn't quite enough to really generate sufficient change from their perspective it took quite a while to get um, the permission, but um, we, we got there in the end. We ended up having to build the soft um, features first, and then we had a gap before we were able to actually wet them by doing the hard work, the, uh, the um, hard engineering. We weren't actually able to divert the road runoff into the swales um, for a good 18 months. So that was, that, was, that was quite problematic at the time. Another challenge was getting the maintenance correct. Um, there's two different authorities maintain two parts of the, the site um, and the, um, the guys that go do the mowing initially did mow it overly, but we, uh, we've, uh, we've talked to them and they are now um, maintaining it much better. 
Um, it took a little while. It's a bit of a change in approach to make. We don't. We don't want these sites mowing um, on the bait on the frequency they were doing it before. Um, we did seed it with wildflower seed, and they're just cutting it back once a year now to allow after flowers have set. So, as well as storing that water and reducing flood risk to the properties locally um, and trapping the pollution, it's actually created some really nice habitat. I guess um, another of the challenges on this site is we haven't had a whole lot of local interest. I think generally people aren't that interested um, locally, but um, you know it's it's been a useful and it's been an interesting scheme to go, and it's working really nicely now. We've actually put an interpretation board up as well, so and that's that's the first one. Um, the next site I wanted to talk about is actually on the Hatchford Brook, um, which is a tributary of the Coal in Birmingham. Um, this is in Sheldon Country Park, right next door to the airport. Um, we were um, invited to come and do some weir removal initially on this brook. Um, you'll see one of the weirs on the top left hand corner. It was just over a metre high. One of two weirs it was interfering with fish passage. Um, so the scheme um, was originally about the weir removal, but in order to qualify for the funding, and I think the funding was a, one of the biggest challenges on this site, um, we needed, we want, we were able to access some ERDF funding through Solihull um, Metropolitan Borough Council. Um, we needed to do a lot of biodiversity works at the same time. So as well as removing the weirs, we did quite a lot of restoration along the watercourse. And the bottom slide is showing the watercourse beforehand, where you can see a big bank of nettles. There's actually a path, path to the right of the nettles. Um, but the, the public who do use this, an awful lot of public use the park, they weren't really able to engage with their watercourse and they really didn't appreciate the impact of the weirs. Um, so the pictures on the right, um, one of the, this is the, there's two weirs, um, the downstream weir, you can, this is the site afterwards and you, you can see there's a lot, an awful lot of habitat has developed really very quickly upstream of that weir. From a geomorphological perspective, the whole watercourse is about 400 metres of watercourse is a lot more diverse. Um, the bottom site also illustrates the change in the bank structure we did. We reprofiled a lot of the banks to make it a lot more visible and accessible for the public. Um, in terms of challenges, um, it was it's always been quite interesting talking to the city council who maintain the site. Um, they are um, struggling for maintenance costs. Um, we have designed the scheme, so it requires less maintenance than before. Um, um, but uh, I, I guess we haven't really had quite the level of um, dialogue with the maintenance people that we would hope for. Um, so that has been a bit of a challenge. We did some woodland work as well. And again, that was um, interesting in that they they haven't been able to talk to us about the, the level of uh, management that we might quite like. But um, and also um, the airport next door, that was a bit of a challenge um, because they didn't want some of the habitat work because they were worried about bird strike. Um, but we uh, we managed to get them agree to the scheme. Um, you'll see a picture on the right, you know, people are able to engage with the watercourse a lot more, a lot better now. Um, another complication we had was um, we had to do a flood risk assessment and a planning application. The whole thing took about a year of just planning. Um, you'll see the picture on the right shows the blue area shows where flood risk was reduced as a result of the weir removal. And actually there's a school just, just um, about halfway along on the left bank. The flood risk was reduced as school, but we had to get evidence that um, the landowners were um, agreeable to the, the scheme before we were given planning permission to do it. And there was some quite complicated dialogue with the Environment Agency before we were able to get the permissions in place. So yeah, again, the, the partnership and the, the permissions took a long time. Um, but we've got a really good result in the end and it was worthwhile putting the, putting the legwork in. The last site I want to talk about um, is on the Saffron Brook, which is in Leicester. It's a tributary of the Saw. This particular stretch is in uh, two city parks run by the Leicester City Council. The top one is in Knighton Park and the bottom one is in Washbrook Park. Both, um, both the Washbrook goes through both. <clears throat> in many areas, the Washbrook was heavily engineered beforehand. You can see the revetment on the right of the bank um, on the top photograph and on the bottom photograph, you can see a, a sort of fairly fort, uniform channel. It was heavily shaded, very little access. 
sorry, that's my timer. Um, so afterwards, we, we, we did a lot of river restoration. We removed a lot of the, um, the artificial bank revetments to create a much more naturally functioning channel. Um, and we actually installed on the bottom where you can see we took a lot of the, we pollarded quite a lot of the trees to open it up and um, created a lot more light and natural features to create a, a sinuous channel, a lot more natural features and a lot more uh, diverse flows. Um, biggest challenges of again getting permissions um, from the Environment Agency and the, uh, the City Council, but um, after a bit of convincing, they've been really supportive and really understanding. Just the change in river management has, has taken quite a bit of dialogue to get them to back it. And again, we've had a lot of... Uh, conversations with the public a lot of people were unsure or uneasy about what we were doing but we you know had to take quite a lot of time supervision on site talking to them about about what we were doing and so on so I think that long term unknown of what we were doing but once we talked to them about it and explained it and showed them uh, people were generally supportive <clears throat> but the legwork to get to these endpoints um was was quite challenging um, that is the end of my slot um, I've talked about the three sites. I'm happy to take questions at the end. Um, but now I'm going to pass on to Tor Coombs, who's going to talk to us from Leicestershire. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Ruth. Um, good evening, everyone. So I'm Victoria Coombs, um, known in the industry as Tor. I'm the Fudges Manager at Leicestershire County Council. Uh, I've been there six years. Uh, before that, I was based with Derbyshire County Council and Consultancy. And thanks, Ruth, for that great presentation. Um, Leicester County Council shares a lot of those frustrations and challenges with a lot of the nature-based solution work that we're conducting. And so we'll probably cover off quite a lot of the same sort of things in my presentation. So um, if you could start my the next slide, please, Ruth, that'd be great. So I was just gonna start by saying that we are, I'm representing tonight the Legal Local Flood Authority, that's Leicester County Council. Uh, and we coordinate the management of local flood risk. So we have that sort of overarching strategic role for local flood risk. Um, and it, we were really established following the PIP review. So I'm giving that two tier perspective. So the County Council, uh, Dean Ward, giving that um, district council perspective, sorry, the unitary council perspective, um, which um, hopefully you'll see for our presentations is a much easier job, Dean. Um, are you having trouble, Ruth, getting to oh, the first slide? It's not moving. It's all right. I can um, carry on waffling. So I don't know what I've done different. <laughs> Ruth, would you like me to try okay. it? Oh, okay, go ahead. Yep, right? so we have... yeah. yep, we are, yep. So we have a duty to produce a local flood risk management strategy, which is currently out for consultation. So a bit of a plug there for anyone that's interested. Um, and it's essentially our business plan for how we'll um, how we think local flood should be managed in Leicestershire. And we have set five objectives and five principles um, of which nature-based solutions is at the heart of. So um, things such as working with communities, uh, adapting to climate change, delivering multiple benefits, they're all critical for the success of nature-based solutions. Um, next slide, please, Ruth. So um, again, this gives you a nice uh, flavor for last year. So we've got um, eight local planning authorities uh, and that's, that's the city in the middle. Um, but one of our other strategy duties, other than the producing the strategy, is that we're a strategy consultee to the planning process for surface water change matters for major planning applications. So very specific, especially when explaining that to members of the public. Um, so yeah, we've got eight, eight planning authorities. So that includes our minerals and waste team internally. So that's a lot of different local plans, differing interests, knowledge, experience. Um, generally, they have pretty high turnover of LPA staff. So actually we're trying to build trust and rapport, it's quite a challenge because of the high turnover. Uh, in our responses, we, we, we strongly encourage use of SUDs um, and, and generally mini catchments and avoiding Olympic sized swimming pools. Um, uh, we, we don't uh, adopt SUDs as an authority as it currently stands, uh, only unless they take highway water completely. Um, although SUDs are commonly adopted by sort of management companies, bishop boroughs, town councils, or water companies. Next slide, please, Ruth. So this is just a, a little image of a well, uh, some photos I've taken of a well thought out 
a site that we have commented on. Uh, it's a very steep site. It gives encompasses a range of different sort of, sort of swell features, which is crossed by a wooden bridge to a play area and it eventually feeds down to an attenuation pond. And these are the kind of things that we try to, to really encourage across Leicestershire. It's, um, I, I think you can all agree it's, it's quite attractive and a, and a good way to manage um, surface water on the site. Next slide, please. So, um, and just taking a step back, so after 2010, when we got, um, we, when we became the LFA, we believed Schedule 3 was going to be enacted. Uh, and we spent many years, the County Council, before I joined, we developed a working protocol and worked towards the enactment of Schedule 3. So we, we actually did quite a lot of work at, at Leicestershire to sort of set ourselves up for, this, for the SUDS approval body. Um, and we actually received some applications for, for adoption uh, and we agreed to take them forward. So we sort of worked with the developer to, to create an exciting site that would be acceptable for Leicestershire to adopt. Um, but, then, but then on the 15th of April, 2015, um, the, the, it was pulled from underneath us the rug and they said, actually, you're gonna be the Leicestershire Council 2 role. So then we just were reverted back to just adopting only highway water. So, um, only one to two sites are known to be adopted to have reached the stage that's quite a long time, eight to 10 years. So um, this site on the screen, it, it shows a variety of sort of techniques. So swales, fill strains, panel paving, quite detailed, done by Taylor Wimpy. Um, and there was an estimation of about 100K um, saving uh, compared to additional construction features, um, traditional pipe system. So quite a significant saving really. And, and quite an attractive site and exciting from a sort of potential. However, 10 years on, we are still, we haven't quite adopted it. There's a few issues with the SUDS maintenance in particular. So what we found was they built it um, and we've gone out to sort of check it and make sure it's fine. But uh, we've got there and this, the banks are, are too steep for us to get our mowers on. They haven't built a, whole, a hard surfacing area for any maintenance vehicles and gateways are too narrow, narrow to get any of our um, grass cutting machines on. So, I mean, that's just a sample of some of the problems we found, but generally really a challenge is, does, is the maintenance going to be achievable uh, by an authority? And just to draw your attention that the adoption side of it doesn't currently sit within the LFA remit. It's, um, it's within the team that the LFA sit in, but we don't have that sort of day-to-day -day site of all that adoption um, activity. Uh, next slide, please, Ruth. So as I mentioned earlier, we currently don't adopt SUDs unless they take only highway water. Um, so we, but we do adopt some SUDs balancing ponds associated with major roads. So we've got quite a few of those adopted across the county. And as I mentioned earlier, we have got a couple of those uh, developments that, that were there in that interim period where we thought we were going to be the SAB. So challenge, the key challenges really that we've, we've come across, so I've already mentioned it take, can take 10 years. Similar to sort of what the, the Wales um, the Wales sub implementation, long time for it to get to reach that adoption process. Uh, in our local highway design guide for Leicestershire, which is basically our guide for creation of a site that would be accept acceptable and be adopted, um, there's only such, uh, only reference to such for highway water, so no no real reference of any other type of suds. Um, and, but we are working to update this at the moment. So if the SAB is enacted, that will give us sort of that push to really drive acceptable SUDs, um, not just taking highway water. Um, all SUDs are constructed very differently. So um, you might have a different planting regime and that can cause, um, you know, if we, we can't just send out one gang, we need to make sure they're fully aware of what, what might they might find on site. And that can be quite costly. And we will require a very detailed walkthrough with the um, site operatives to make sure they understand exactly what maintenance is required. And because we're a county authority, we have to speak with lots of different teams internally and externally, which can be very challenging. There's quite a big ge geography distance between us and it can create quite a few issues. Um, and then, sorry, next slide, please, Ruth. Um, and then, in our strategy, we also detail how we local federal should be managed through um, the effective, effective management of assets, watercourse and catchment. So essentially we have a role for um, consenting. We, we, don't, we don't permit, permit culverting works and we actively 
um, encourage deculverting and river restoration, Trent River Trust being one of those very proactive um, charities. Um, pictures on the screen show one at Washbrook, um, the, similar to, I think you were showing that, that project there brief earlier, but this patch is actually an OB uh, in, in the county. Um, and some excellent work sort of renaturalizing the watercourse there, but there still remains challenges from this, you know, from, from consenting and, and, and assets watercourse and catchment management because uh, the general public perceive watercourses to be, or, or some uh, to be a nuisance. And it's, it's quite a challenge to convince members of the public that please don't hide that watercourse. It's better to keep it open from a flutterous perspective, but also the various of the benefits that we, we all know. Um, and then if we do, we are aware of unconsented activities such as culverting. Um, we do have permissive powers to act, but they are permissive. And the legalities or the legal process for, for getting culverts removed as a result of that is, is so unbelievably long-winded and expensive that and we're very unlikely to win. So we generally don't do that. So um, it, it just becomes a really tricky process and we have to, we just log them as unconsented works and, and try and really press the, our culverting policy. Um, Next slide, slide, please, Ruth. So then, and just finally, then the we also within our strategy detail how um, local fodder should be managed through developing and managing local projects. Um, so nature based nature based solutions are heart of most of our projects uh, because they're so they're multi beneficial. Um, a couple of examples on the screen there: Breeden, um, uh, and Medium, where we live natural management uh, and sort of studs. There are many, many challenges for delivering local project, uh, projects. So often we find that property level resilience, uh, so flood doors, non-return valves, etc., they're a more cost-effective solution and probably being the only real way in which you can move forward to deliver a project. Project management is very resource intensive um, and the, it takes a, a hell of a lot of our time and it's not a strategy function. The process for obtaining um, funding is very time consuming. Um, Breedon, for example, one of our projects on the screen there, it, it had funding in 2016 and we're, we're not planning to finish it till 2024. So that's eight years. Um, and then the maintenance of a nature-based solution is just convincing landowners to agree to future maintenance and don't just rip them out when we move away in two years time. Next slide, please, Ruth. So this is just the final um, slide before I summarize. So um, we include the community at the heart of our schemes, and this one in particular shows uh, a school in Stony Santon. So they were affected uh, in 2019 internally, um, and we're looking to deliver a retrofit sub scheme um, and try and be a bit innovative and get the school children involved, get them to buy into it. And it forms part of the water flood, allevi flood alleviation scheme, so encouraging the whole community to be involved and accept and deliver that project. And we've got a range of other retrofit sub schemes um, scheduled for areas in Market Harbour, Grooby, Hinkley, and Kibworth as well. And then finally, so just to summarise key challenges, um, that's me um, with loads of money um, when they enact SAB. That would be the dream. Um, but we know that's not going to happen <laughs> unless there's a money tree somewhere. Um, but really, the key problem for us is resources. That's not just money. It's it's skills, available skill sets, actual numbers of people. Got to train them up to um, maintain the suds uh, and be able to procure contracts to be able to maintain them. Um, internal processes, they need to be amended. So uh, legislation will hopefully drive that and policy change. So um, we're working on the local highway design guide update to try and bring in and, and um, encompass the ethos of natural based solutions. Um, and, and then coordination and collaboration of teams. Again, our geography is quite wide um, and it, is, it really is a challenge. We can't just open the double doors and speak to our uh, planners like Dean can. Um, <laughs> I'm just a bit jealous, Dean, that's all. Um, but uh, hypothetically, is is the geography is, is a real quite a sticking point really to make sure to try and talk about something that requires so many different skill sets all coming together and towards the same goal. And that's it. Thank you very much. 
Super, thanks for that tour. Um, so hello everyone, I'm Dean Ward, I'm the Head of Highways and Infrastructure at Solihull uh, Borough Council. Uh, we're a unitary authority, which means we're also the maintenance team as well as the lead local flood authority. And that gives us a real opportunity to determine exactly what we want with the existing and proposed schemes. Also means I'm going to be coming at this from a, a very slightly different perspective. Um, can you go to the next slide for me, please, Ruth? Um, as a bit of background, we have six drainage maintenance operatives um, sharing three vehicles. They work in pairs. Um, we have around about 40,000 highway drainage assets, gullies and, and the like, across the borough. They all need cleaning at least once a year, which means they have around about 56 seconds per highway drain um, to, to clean if we're going to keep on top of our, our KPIs and make sure that our, our roads and infrastructure is working as best it can. So. As you can imagine, uh, as a result of that, we're working pretty hard to look for alternatives to, to, to move towards more nature based solutions, removing uh, retrospectively as much buried drainage as we can. Um, and you can imagine with the increased housing numbers through our local plans coming forward, our ability to keep on top of our maintenance is becoming quite challenging. Thankfully, yeah, unlike a uh, county council, you know, we have a revenue and maintenance budgets which can help support us in the delivery of these interventions. As a team, you know, we're, we're very, very keen on SUDs. We like them, we adopt them. Um, so we have a very uh, useful working relationship with our parks team, with our landscape teams, our environmental teams, ecology teams and planners, um, so that we actually get a holistic view on taking on either a new SUDs feature um, from a new development, wherever that may be, or if it's ourselves coming in retrospectively to take away some highway drainage and put in a feature such as a, a swale or a filter drain. Um, if you can skip on to the next slide for me. Um, we've spent quite a lot of time over the last couple of years working with developers, reviewing layouts, making sure that all aspects are covered. Because one of the things that we found with developers is that they're happy to take on SUDs and new development if we work with them from the outset and they don't lose other things within their development, which they're going to need to make a site viable, such as the actual housing itself. Here's just one example. We took an end of pipe solution, that, uh, um, a housing developer who I'm not going to name just in case, um, provided for us. Skip onto the next slide. You can see we've rejigged that layer. We've done uh, filter drains, roadside swales, and there was then no buried surface water drainage um, other than the, you know, the seven trend adopted systems. So all the highway drainage and, and everything came into this SUD system. Um, and it meant that actually we got a far better solution at the end and they got to keep all their units on site. They didn't lose anything because that blue green infrastructure was built in at the very, very outset. Um, skip onto the next slide, you can see what part of that looked like. So one of the big, big aspects for us, and again, because we're the highways authority as well as the flooding authority, we get to determine this, we moved to a single-sided footway. So that meant that where a footway would have been on the other side, as you can see here, we've actually got a lovely nice filter drain swale and some curb drain there that does a far better environment than having a footpath up against the side of someone's property in a residential wall we we truly believe this is this is a better way and again we adopt it we maintain it the the second one there again it's a, a new development that's still being built out but a piece of shared surface footway cycleway rather than having a, a hard traffic island in the middle there we move towards a, a suds facility um, and again looks a lot better um, and from a maintenance perspective it's easier for us to look after it's not buried drainage it's not gullies it's you know our, our parks team and our landscaping team coming around with the with the mower once in a while and, and making sure it looks looks nice move to the next slide for me um, and equally it is also about building up that multifunctional space so here's a here's another great example that was before my time so i can't take any credit for it although i've tried before um, our parks team and our landscape team and, and the drainage team worked really, really closely with the modelers and the site designers to actually look at how we can benefit play space into SUDS features. And, and that opened up a range of different nature based solutions and an educational board, as you can see here, that were scattered all around this trail. 
uh, for kids to go and play, to go and explore, and to understand what the SUDS features are, what they do, but again, also actually get in and out. And the, the feature still does exactly what we want it to do, and it's still in with our usual maintenance regime. That's all the good stuff. It's easy to talk about all the good stuff because everybody knows what that is. There are problems though. Um, it sounds like it's great that we will just go and build SUDS and we'll adopt them and we'll take them on. If you skip to the next slide for me, we do still have issues with developers not building SUDS as, as we'd agreed to, as they're designed. You know, this one looks fantastic, but the scale is deceiving. Um, we talked about this yesterday. That's water level to top of bank is four meters and that side is one in two. So that's a pretty high risk one for us. We're, we're still avoiding taking that on. There are issues around third parties, such as utilities companies. When we were talking about the having footway on the one side of the road, we've had to work very closely with BT, um, National Grid and others to make sure they're not going to come up and dig up all of that swale, that filter drain, to put the utilities in to get to those properties, to make sure they're working and not having to reinstate something that then is broken. We have difficulties with residents. People see water and they instantly think it's dangerous. One of our biggest issues and biggest challenges with delivering nature-based solutions is actually a perception of risk. There is still, certainly in our borough, uh, a very traditional view of out of sight, out of mind, where people think all they need to do, build big tanks, put it underground, everything will be fine and it'll all go away and there'll be no more flooding. And we all know, you know, I'm preaching to the converted here on this call, but we all know that's not the right way to go about things. People have different priorities. Residents will you know, have different views. They'll be considering, you know, where can I park my car? You've put a slail down the side of my house. I can't park my car here anymore. And these are big things. And these are the biggest challenges that we really have to, have to get through as a local authority. So we want them. We will maintain them. We will adopt them. That's all, all great stuff for us. But it's actually selling them to the local communities to say these will benefit you. And they will actually make the local area, the area that you're in, a far more attractive place and better for the environment because you're not seeing our vehicles driving up and down, you know, the carbon that that would generate from all of our maintenance operations. And that is a very quick whistle stop tour for me and we'll open up to questions. Brilliant. Thank you, Dean. And also thank you, Tor uh, and Ruth. So that was a really fantastic collection of presentations that provided an overview of the opportunities and challenges. So please do take the opportunity to have a look at the questions, vote for ones that you think are important, but also add your own. I mean, what, what I took from that really are some similarities really with some of the challenges you've, you, you talked about there with some of the research that we released early in the year around surface water management, talking about the challenges around collaboration, particularly within county councils and dealing with all the other stakeholders, but also working locally with residents and their perceptions of what good looks like and what's safe, uh, and also trying to work with uh, landowners in terms of their responsibilities, particularly around nature-based solutions and natural flood management. So yeah, really, really interesting, but I'm really glad that you also highlighted the opportunities about creating better uh, places and spaces for people and wildlife, but it doesn't come with any challenge. So I will go through to the first questions and we've got a number of questions that all seem to be hanging around uh, four votes, but we've got one that's a bit of a outlier uh, and it's for you Ruth. It's regarding Saffron Book and um, they said how has the potential river bank erosion risk been mitigated? Um, I don't think we have mitigated for it. Um, river bank erosion we see as a natural process. Generally where you get erosion you get a deposition. Uh, we did have to talk to the landowner they were comfortable with erosion risk. Um, the land behind the bank is natural um, there's vegetation, it's public open space, the roots of the trees will probably withstand a certain amount of erosion anyway, and if it does erode a little bit, it's no loss. Um, the county council is comfortable with the natural processes. It's not always going to be the case. There will be case, there will be situations where erosion is not acceptable. If there's some infrastructure path or some other 
functioning space is required, then it wouldn't always be appropriate to remove the revetment. But on that particular case, and in many cases, removal of the revetments is absolutely fine with very little risk. Thank you for that, Ruth. And there's another question relating to the Saffron Brook uh, project. Uh, how did you prove that the benefits of the restoration would outweigh the negatives of felling the trees? Um, so there were willows. Uh, willows grow very fast. Um, I think a, a reach view was taken in that the wash brook extends for uh, a kilometre or more through that brook and that the loss of some trees in that area was a good thing because more variety along the, the course of the brook. So there are trees in the area in terms of conservation and ecological interest, a small loss of trees. Uh, created more diversity in the area as a whole um, and, and it added value to the to the to the park um, in a holistic sense so yeah the benefit of opening it up and um, changing the the light and the vegetation structure on that particular reach offset much more than the impact and I think the um, the increase in engagement on that site and the visibility hugely um, offsets any negative because people can see that watercourse now whereas yep. before they just couldn't really see it very well and from our perspective there was a path there was a bridge across it it's really really important that people can see it they can see pollution if it comes they can see the flooding if it comes they can engage and they can understand that watercourse a lot better so from an engagement perspective as well as an ecological perspective I you know we the, the decision was that it was a good thing to do Thanks, Ruth. That connectivity and accessibility to some of this in terms of recreation and also uh, public spaces are really important. So there's a question here that's targeted towards you, Dean, but I might open it up to Tor and, and Ruth really around with regards to the move to nature based solutions and where possible trying to manage water on the surface and close to it falls. What has your engagement been like with regards to communities around safety are they concerned about pond features with open open water do they think it's flooding do they think it's unsafe i suppose really uh, as the question was pointed to you dean if i start with you and i'll work my way around tour uh, and ruth around well, what challenges have you had around safety and how have you overcome them yeah it's it it's twofold for us really if it's a a new housing development and it's a new you know new sub system and set of features like that then obviously people are going into that a bit more with their eyes open because they're before they're buying the house they're seeing the environment that's around them we before we take on any feature um we tend to get rosper involved because they do sub safety audits um and we would always push the recommendations of that sub safety audit onto a developer or whoever has been responsible for the construction of those features. One of the things that Ross will talk about actually is fencing is not always the safest option because once you're in, it's easy to get in over a fence than it is to get back out over a fence. We talk about safety by design and sometimes that can actually mean more structured planting around a feature to prohibit access rather than something like a fence that really just gates things off, um, but not very well. On the, on the ones that we fit, we do do community engagement. We tend not to put in deep water features. Most of our features that we put in, because they're for highway drainage purposes, are designed to be dry almost all of the time. Um, and when they fill with water, that's just, you know, everyone's going to be hiding indoors anyway, so you don't really see it. So we don't really get too much of it on that side. Okay, thanks, Dean. Tor? Sorry, I just want to find the unmute button. Um... I'll be honest, like I say, as we generally have adopted um, suds that relate to major roads, they're, they're the most of it, really. So there's not really much feedback from the general public. The only bit that I potentially could add is um, whilst we're sort of embarking on the suds for schools projects now, it's just ensuring and we have, you know, we've had this sort of we haven't actually delivered the project yet so just to just to make that a bit clearer apologize in case anyone misunderstood that that the school want to be um, engaged and active but they do obviously when we talk about potential ponds and things about there is this sort of safety concern and how we make, make it accessible to to the school children without a danger so that's something that's a challenge that we've got to overcome and we'll just 
obviously use other exemplary um, projects and, and, and learn from those. Um, because like I say, we don't want to create Olympic size swimming pools. We want to create something that's accessible and the children can, can use to learn from. Thanks, but, yeah, so, I, I know there's an awful lot of case studies on the SOSDRAIN website about where schools have been successfully retrofitted. I know the Department of Education has been looking at uh, SUDS and Poxy Blood Resilience together as a package. So hopefully there'll be more, more examples. And I also know the Greater London Authority has got a fairly decent uh, uh, document on reimagining uh, rainwater, which looks at schools particularly. So yeah, thank you for that. And Ruth, with regards to some of your projects, how, how often does safety come up as a, as a challenge? It does from time to time. Again, we try to manage, manage it in the design. Um, we always suggest that um, improving access, improving uh, to a watercourse is a good thing by shallowing the banks, by creating shallows in the watercourse so people can actually get into the watercourse safely and get out yep. safely with a, with a gently showing black, with a gently shelved bank. Um, and we would actively pursue that because we want people to get close to the watercourse. We want people to get in and out and a lot of our works are involved around removing a vertical bank because a vertical bank is definitely dangerous um with silty flat bottoms with uh, bottom, bottom of channels which again is is dangerous so again river restoration is a good thing because it means the silt is more likely to be washed out the banks will be more um and the beds be more stable with gra uh, gravel riffles and so on um we do suggest that people um, think carefully about accessing the watercourse and don't do it during times of flood and wash their hands after they've you know they've put their hands in the water because it, potentially the watercourse does have some risks with it um, but then so does life and you know uh, crossing the road is infinitely more risky um, so we just want people to have a proportionate approach, response to that risk and we want them to feel comfortable getting close to water so that they just that they have a closer closer connection with it and to, to take in that risk into proportion with with other things because the benefits of that that water can bring them are hugely outweighing the risks if they treat it sensibly completely thank you and, and i think there's kind of like a, there's there's a cycle of process that needs to be done with regards to managing risk in terms of designers need to think about risk assessments and something that's potentially uh un, unsafe to maintain will be unsafe for people to use as well so uh trying to make sure that there's there's benefits throughout that. So we've got another question here uh, from Thomas that talks about maintenance of SUDS. And I suppose really being and so it probably comes down to some of the work that you're doing with regards to how do you make sure that that, main, that maintenance is undertaken and is done at a correct time with using the correct methods. So is there something here about uh, what can be done in terms of making sure that maintenance is following good practice and the right people know what to do when? Do you want me to come in? Go on, um, you, go, you go first. Well, I was, I was just going to say that um, it's a good question. And I think that's the, the thing that's lacking the most at the moment with regards to uh, residential developments and even our own um, ponds uh, that we create as part of major roads. Um, as I've mentioned, lots of different teams involved in designing major road and then the adoption and maintenance side of it. They all sit together and making sure there's a smooth handover, there's an understanding of what's actually there, what they're required to maintain. Um, our maintenance team, they don't have a, um, a ring fence budget. So anything that they accrue through um, commuters, some, but it, it very often gets spoiled up in the central, central part. And so it's we generally become quite reactive even, even to assets of our own. Um, but I do think that the SAB with regards to residential dwelling um, sites and commercial sites, the SAB could go some way to addressing this if we, we can um, properly gear ourselves up for a properly trained um, maintenance team that understand what we need to do, when we need to do it and how, and, and that we've got the money to do that. Um, but at the minute, we, we do rely on members of the public reporting um, concerns and then we pass, we generally either pass it on to the local planning authority or the management company or, or, or whatever. Great, Dean, thanks. did you want to add anything? Yeah, I think it, and it's, it, it's, slightly, it's slightly different for us, but I think one of the, the biggest 
issues that we're facing at the moment with with the maintenance of suns is they've never been tested for this amount of time every every year goes by we're entering new territory with their longevity um so we you know we'll have put filter drains in you know five six seven years ago that we think oh maybe they've got a lifetime of, of 10 or 15 years before we need to rip them out and replace them and start again some depending on the area the nature of use are getting are getting absolutely battered some are still you know nice and clean and fresh as if they're almost new and it it comes down to that intensification of use. So we're all aware of everything that's going on with HS2. There are certain routes within our borough where we're having to have our drains cleaned once a week, where we'd normally be cleaning them once a year because the sheer volume of HGV movements going in and out of um, compounds and, and building sites is, is causing absolute havoc. And it's really just trying to trying to keep on, on top of it. And there's no there's no way to do it. We have some ring fenced cash for this maintenance. But if, as I say every year we go through, we, we find something new that crops up that we didn't know before. And it's good in one way because it's all useful evidence. But equally, you know, every time you stick a, a camera down a, a gully or up a headwall or into a manhole, you find something unexpected and then have to try and scrape around for the cash to work out how to fix it. Great, thank you. And, and there's also uh, there's also an emphasis on the designer making sure that they actually provide that maintenance and management schedule yeah. uh, before before work starts. Really. Uh, yeah. So, Ruth, thank you for those. Sorry, thank you for those answers, Dean and Tor. Ruth, there's a question here for on maintenance for you as well. So it's from Craig. Craig Borman is asking what kind of maintenance is associated with renaturalizing a river river he struggles to understand the different what difference there might be in terms of the maintenance required between a weir and an, a non-weird section of the river um we would or in all cases we would suggest uh, a weir does create a maintenance um requirement because it it traps sediment and uh, potentially other debris um uh, a section without a weir, um, I suppose if we, we if we're looking at a, a restoration scheme, which is often where we come in to look at a section of river, we will always design it um, with a low flow channel so that that uh, channel is self cleansing, if you like, and that there's a flood channel which um, which caters for the larger flood events. Um, which will be where the greater habitat interest is in terms of a bigger mosaic of habitats within on the bed and in the banks. Um, but that sort of scheme is relatively low maintenance. That's the idea. So that the low flow channel keeps itself clear and the higher flow channel, it doesn't matter really what happens because it needs that, you know, it benefits from having that extra vegetation within it. It adds roughness to the channel and it slows the flow of the water. So there is there shouldn't really be a need for an awful lot of maintenance as long as it as long as um, as long as that low flow plan, plan low flow channel remains clear. There will be occasions where maybe a bit of a massive bit of debris comes in and blocks that low flow channel, or maybe a lot of tree growth blocks that low flow channel. And yes, there will be occasions where some maintenance is is required. But we always try to promote promote uh, schemes where the maintenance is as low as as manageable. Thank you for that. So there's a question here around partnership funding, and I didn't want to leave the webinar without talking about it because I know what a challenge it can be. So I suppose really is trying to what be good to do is try and work out where, whether partnership working, or sorry, partnership funding has been successful for you, and what what enabled that success. And if it hasn't, be honest about that as well. But it'd be good to understand whether you've had any wins with regards to partnership funding. So, Ruth, can I ask ask you first with regards to that? Um, pretty well. Uh, the majority of our projects are funded from multiple pots, so yeah. we would class that as partnership funding. We see a big part of our role in delivering water-based projects is pooling more to several sources of funding to create a greater benefit than would be available by just single organizations doing it on their own so it is a key part of how we work um, we absolutely want to deliver multiple benefit projects 
a lot of our work on nature-based solution will deliver flood risk benefits, it'll deliver water quality, biodiversity and amenity work. So we absolutely partnership is sort of is is how we how we operate really. Um, but I do have to say you need to get that stakeholder buy-in early. You need to uh, bring everybody into the discussion at early stage um, so people feel involved and engaged and they're more likely to support it. Um, just um, and, and it's it's more it's more tricky and delicate perhaps than you might think. And then often when there's funding and milestones and delivery uh, requirements and objectives, some of them are quite difficult to balance um, across a particular project, you know, when there's potential conflicts or differences in approach or differences in time scales, time scales and milestones and that can be quite complex and it shouldn't be underestimated sometimes it is a challenge well often usually it's a challenge but we've got quite good at that now um but yeah you, you need to you need to allow time to get those conversations had yeah brilliant I was going to say that that's what seems to be the underlying uh effort involved is really around the, the time taken and also trying to match the potential benefits with the beneficiaries in terms of working out what's in it for them and, and de delivering it for them as well. Dean? Um, it's a bit it's a bit more difficult for us because one of the one of the issues we have we, we get funding and we get partnership contributions when we latch on to our landscape and ecology colleagues who are dealing with the ERDF for example. Um, but one of the big issues that we do fa still face with that is that is really only the capital investment to deliver the scheme. They don't. Most of these funding providers don't allow you to put in a thirty-year maintenance cost um, build, building into a bid, so you can actually look after it after the fact. They say, "Oh yeah, here's some money to go and here's some money to go and install something," but after that, you're on your own. Um, so we've had some successes in the delivery. We're still struggling with, you know, and I'm sure it's also the same about the actual cost to then look after it yeah. thank you dean cool yeah just um just echoing a lot of that as well um marrying up people's uh, ben beneficiaries with amounts are going to gift the processes of obtaining the funding very often it's easier just to go for one big pot of funding than try and bring four or five different pots together especially when you've got a small scheme the amount if you the amount of work that you have to put in to uh, project manage and deliver a project um, is the same, I think, really from a small to a large scheme. So um, you can spend most of your time running around trying to keep partners engaged and secure that funding. And often it's as easy as to go for the sort of the one big pot. But again, we have to demonstrate the partnership funding approach when we apply for national funding. So we still have to pursue it as best we can. Yeah. Uh, it's just very, very laborious. But hopefully worth it in the end. So yeah, I think there's there's definitely um, success, and we definitely support the positive um, ideas of partnership funding to, to deliver a project. It's just very project management intensive, and yeah, when you when you have to be really skilled in project management to deliver project management projects, and but none of us at Leicestershire have had that formal project management training, so we are learning on the job. Yeah, yeah. And that was exactly what came out on the surface water management review that we did that we released in May. So so that brings us to the end of the hour, pretty much. So I just want to thank Dean, Ruth and Tor for some really great presentations that sparked some interesting questions. So I want to thank the delegates for their time in terms of the questions and also you for your answers. So please do keep your eye out for any other events coming up. I don't think I can't imagine there will be a couple of months that we won't have something on nature-based solutions from a branch in Cyrem somewhere. So please do keep an eye out for that. But also, uh, please do keep an eye out for activities that we're taking forward because we're keen to take forward some uh, develop some training on partnership working as well. So if you're interested in getting involved in that, please do uh, drop us a line through our, our general email or, or just uh, let Barbara know because there's some really great work we're doing on that going forward. So thank you, everybody, and have a good evening.